spending a part two of a short series just called The End. And this series, just a, for East Coast Believer Standard, standard just a very short series. We usually, I usually do four and five week series. This is part two of a two week series just called The End. And really it's, it's talking about are we living in the last days? Uh, if we are, then how should we respond to that? The Bible is not silent on this subject, to be honest with you. Honestly, it's probably the number one, one of the top five questions I get from people. Are we living in in the end. Is this the end? And I just want to talk about that. Uh, last week, I encourage you to go back and listen to those that last week is a little more technical. Today's going to be theology heavy. And if you're a scripture, if you love a lot of scripture, this is going to be your day. And so get ready. We're going to go real, real fast. But it's based out of a verse in First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. And it said, men who understood the times to know what Israel should do. And here's my thought. If we understand the times that we're living in, it should inspire us to live differently. And a lot of people, when we talk about end times, they get paralyzed by fear and the mark of the beast and, you know, what is it going to be like? People are going to be hiding in caves. Well, let's just find out what the Bible says. And honestly, if we understood the times, maybe you would live differently. It's almost like, a, like you know, in football, when it's a two-minute warning and you're at the very end, you have to leave it all on the field. You have to give it your all. And I, here's my thought. If you knew that you were living in the last days at the end, then maybe you would live differently. So last week I went through all the different signs that really with great accuracy, the Bible talked about the first coming of Jesus and also it points to the second coming of Jesus through a lot of prophecy. You might not know this, but, but about one third of your Bible is biblical prophecy and, uh, and, and most of it's been fulfilled. And so, in fact, there's one, someone asked me, they go, really, is evangelism exploding? That was one of the signs of the second coming of Jesus. Is, is evangelism exploding across the world, really? And honestly, what we'll find out is right now there are 171 nations of the, in the world out of 193 where Christianity is growing faster than the population rate. There's advanced, in fact, there's one nation, South Korea. You heard of North Korea, but South Korea, even 50 years ago, was just 3% Christians. Now it's almost 60%. In one generation, they went from 3% to 60%. I'm just letting you know that the Bible accurately predicts the day and the age that we're living in. And I want to answer the question, are we living in the last days? And if we are, how should we act? And here's the big question. Are you ready to live in the last days? One of the major tenets of our faith is found in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. Of course, Jesus had walked on the earth for 40 days after he resurrected on the third day. It said, then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said, he's talking to them. And they want to know when. They're like a lot of us. When, Lord? When are you going to do this? Everyone's been asking that question. He said, he said to them, it's not for you to know the time or the date as the Father is set by his own authority. But on Pentecost Sunday, I want you to hear this verse. But you will receive the Holy Spirit when he comes on you and you will be my witnesses. He said, hey, you're going to be focusing on when am I going to restore all this. He goes, I want you to be focusing in, on using your life to make a difference in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, it ends in verse 9. He said, after he said all this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking up into heaven, as you probably would too, into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. These angels show up, and they said, men of Galilee, these disciples, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Well, if I was that answer, because I just saw a man float right up out of the ground. That's why I would be. And they said, this same Jesus who had been taken from you in heaven, here it is. He will come back in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. Here's what I want you to know. The Bible says this over and over and over again, that Jesus is coming again. And it's, it's all through the scripture. In fact, there's a, and if you'll read this, the Bible, and you'll just look for some of these clues, you'll see it over and over and over again. Like one of my favorite Stories, of course, is when Jesus went into the, to the cross, then he went into the tomb for three days. Well, in John's gospel, he gives us a hint about Jesus coming back. Well, what happened was is Jesus had arisen. The, the disciples went to the tomb. They heard about it. They wanted to go find out, like, is he really alive? Where is his body? Even though he'd been saying this. And there's a little clue in John chapter 20 and verse 7. It said, then come, cometh Simon Peter following him, talking about John. 
And, and they went to the sepulcher and seen the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, it was not lying, lying with the other clothes. So I want you to get this picture. Jesus had been wrapped. It was very Hebrew tradition, culture then. They would wrap their body. And so when he arose, all those grave clothes, he just took them and threw them in a pile. But then the one that wrapped his head, it was a napkin. He did something different with it. He folded it. And it says this, not lying with the linen clothes, but it was wrapped together in a place by itself. Which would seem like, what's so significant about that? Well, much like our culture, but especially Hebrew culture, when you're eating at a dinner table, and when you're going to get up and use the restroom, have to go do an errand, and you're going to come back and eat again, you would take your napkin and you would fold it up neatly and put it beside your plate. But if you're done eating, you just bunch it up and throw it on your plate. That means you're not coming back. That means you're done. Jesus, he, took, he wanted to give you a clue. That when, even when he rose up, he took the time to fold his napkin and say, hey, I need you to know something. I'm coming back again. That's what we need to know. And, and so a lot of us go, well, this is hard for me to grasp and understand. I get it. Corinthians talked about this. Paul said, man, I'm going to tell you a mystery. Behold, I, this is a mystery to a lot of us. And I get that. In times can be that way. But he said, there's going to be a group, a generation, that we shall not all sleep. A generation, there's going to be one generation that they're not going to die. Why? But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet that Thessalonians talked about. A trumpet's going to sound, and for that trumpet will sound, and here it is, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. It's, it might not be our generation, but for what I can see in Scripture, every prophecy has been fulfilled except for one, and that is we got to preach the gospel in all the world. That's why I'm so proud of this church. You don't just take care of this church. You make sure the gospel is being preached all over the world. But so I get the question, well, what's it going to be like? That's where all the fear comes from, the mark of the beast, the antichrist, the one world system. And like, where am I going to be in all of this? Well, let me just kind of walk you through what the Bible talks about. And, and, you know, they don't do this now. Whenever I go to the mall with my kids and I say, hey, is there a, this store at the mall? And they'll go, hold on a minute, they pull their phone out and go, Psh, and they put it, and we just walk by the GPS. But remember us old people? When we went to the mall, we wanted to find out there was a store there. Remember there was a big map in the middle? And you remember that little sign that said, you are here? Well, that's, that's what I want to use. Remember that map, you are here. Let me just tell you where you are and where you're going in terms of what the Bible says about a dispensation. Right now where you are is we're in the called the dispensation of grace. This is called the church age. That's where you are right now. What's so unique about this church age is this, that God has one thing on mind, reconciling men to himself. God's not mad at anybody. His wrath is not being poured out. He's not angry. He did all of that on Jesus. And here's where you are. And this is the age, because a lot of people say, well, I see God in the Old Testament. And then I even Revelation, it looks like there's, like God's going to do some other things, but he's not doing that now. You want to know why? Because we're in the dispensation of grace right now. We, we don't get what we deserve, we get what Jesus paid for. Yeah. And, and here's the scripture, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Well, you see in the Old Testament, God was patient, but he's very patient with you in the New Testament. Not wanting anyone to perish, but this is the job of the church right now. But he wants everyone to come to repentance. And within, that's where we are, but this is soon ending, we know that. And then the second thing that's going to happen is, the next thing is the rapture of the church. We just spoke about it. Last week we talked about this verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. All that simply means is this. Anyone who's died ahead of you that's a Christian, we put their body into the tomb or whatever how you did it, whether you cremated it, but their spirit went to heaven. Well, that's going to be reunited. After that, after that happens in a moment, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together 
That's the Greek word for rapture. And it comes from the Latin word rapture. And it means to snatch up. God's going to catch you up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now what he says is this. Don't be afraid of this moment. This is a great moment. Encourage one another with these words. Like it's not to be like, oh man, go hide and, you know, cash in your retirement and buy a bunch of, you know, Patriot food supply. And I'm not saying that's wrong if you want to do that. But he's what he's saying. You're going to be gone for all that bad stuff that's coming. You're going to be raptured. Well, then something else happens. The tribulation period, it's a seven-year period. But at the same time, we're going to have the wedding feast of the Lamb. Let me explain all that stuff. The Antichrist and all the things that, like, you don't, that you, you're, you're, concerned about and don't want to be involved in. Well, the Bible says that if you're a believer, you're going to be raptured for a seven-year feast. Well, there's a seven-year tribulation going down here on this earth. And so I don't I even believe that. Well, look what the Bible says. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Well, then after that, there's another dispensation, another event that's going to happen. And it's called the second coming of Jesus. That's where he's going to come back with all of the saints that went to heaven and all those caught up in the rapture. And we're going to come and live on this earth for a thousand years. And then after all of that, something else is going to happen. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. I think a lot of us think, well, when all this thing ends, I'm just going to go to heaven and just kind of float on clouds and be a bunch of little fat baby angels feeding me grapes and playing you know, violins and singing in the choir. And I don't know about you, that doesn't seem like heaven. That seems like hell to me. And, and I don't know if I want that. But he said, there's going to be a new heaven. Here, here's the, and a new earth. And that earth is going to be just like it is now. There's going to be mountains. And there's going to be golf courses and tennis and pickleball and restaurants and schools. And all of that's going to occur. But here's the difference. All of the stain of sin is going to be gone. Racism is going to be gone. Sickness, disease is going to be gone. Hatred and lying, all that is going to be gone. Here, here's the Bible verse for it. Revelation 21 and verse 3 said, I heard a voice thunder from the throne. Look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. They're his people He's their God. He will wipe every tear. This is what he's talking about this moment. From their eyes. Death is gone for good, everybody. Tears gone. Crying gone. Pain gone. All the first order of things gone. He's talking about what happened in the Garden of Eden. He said, hey, this new earth is going to be like the Garden of Eden where the lion lays with the lamb. He's, it's going to be where there's going to be no sickness, no disease. Look, he said, I'm making everything new. Write it all down. Each word, here it is, is dependable and accurate. What you need to know, he came the first time. He came the first time to die. He's coming the second time having conquered death. He came the first time as a servant. He's coming back the second time as the king of kings. He came the first time. To, to pay the price for us. He coming back the second time with victory in his hands. That's the God that we serve. And the question is, I can, ask, I can answer some of them for you. Are we living in the last days? Yes, we are. Is Jesus coming again? Yes, he is. But what I can't answer for you is this. And that is, are you ready? Excuse me. Are you ready? Only you can answer that. That's your decision to make. And the Bible tells us, like how to manage this moment. How to, the Bible speaks in great detail how to navigate living in the last days. When Jesus does come back, the Bible says this in Luke chapter 18 and verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Like he wants to know. Like will he find, will your faith be growing? Will your faith be stagnant? Or will your faith even be regressing? Like he wants to know, are you, are you going to be advancing in your walk with him? And the Bible talks about these last days. And I, there's so many verses I could pick from. And I had to squeeze them all into my time here. But there's one that I wanted to point out. And it's going to set me up where I'm going to go with this message this morning. Because I'm going to get real practical. And I'm just going to take 
the second half of this message, just the words of Jesus, just red letter only, as he talks to us about how to live just before he returns, before he comes back again. But in 2 Timothy, Paul said this, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Like things are going to start shifting and changing. He's, you need to know that. People will be lovers of themselves, will be a selfie generation. And I joke about it, but I'm so grateful that Disney World finally got rid of all these selfie sticks. People walk around bumping you in the back of the head with, I mean, people are holding cameras just looking at themselves the whole time. I mean, we are a selfie generation. He said, they will be lovers of money. Well, we, we know that. They will be boastful, proud. So he says, I don't think that's true, boastful and proud. I mean, go look at social media. media. Nobody puts on their bad hair day. No way puts on there like things aren't going right in their life. They only post pictures of things that are going perfect. They want people to think more of them than they really are. Abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited. And I love, I want to focus on this phrase for a moment. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. I just did a quick study on that. Lovers of pleasure. And in the Greek, this is what it says. If you were to read a transliterated version of the Bible, it would literally say this. That they would, lovers of pleasure, is they want happiness at the expense of everything else. Happiness is the most, it becomes my religion. It becomes my idol. That I want to be happy. I deserve to be happy. And here's what I want you to know. Happiness is a blessing, but it's also a terrible God. And, and in other words, that if I love happiness at the expense of everything else. And the reality for a Christian, we don't love happiness at the expense of everything else. We love God at the expense of everything else. People say, well, I just want to come to church. I want you to be happy when you come to church too. But I, I just want to come to church to be happy. And can I just tell you something? That's not why we're coming to church. I want to make you happy. I want you to have a good time here. But we want to come to church not to be happy. We want to come to church to experience the power of God. Because you know why? It's the, this, well, I'm, happiness is the most important thing. It's a form of godliness, but it denies the very power. So you have this Bible. And it's full of 66 books. Well, the last book of the Bible is the book of Revelation. And it's a book that a lot of people are afraid of. It's a book that a lot of people don't want to read. And I get it, because it, it can be confusing. Except at the very beginning of the book, it says, who, who reads this book will be blessed. And when you read the book of Revelation, it goes through all the dispensations that we just talked about. And it can be confusing, because you think, this is talking about where I am right now. But there's some things in that book that you're not going to be here for during the tribulation period. After, it'll be happening after the rapture. And there's words in there like scrolls and seals. And there's words in there like the trumpets and dragons and beasts and the angels. And there's bulls and there's Babylon and there's dragons and all this sort of thing. And it seems so complicated. And my job is to make it as simple as possible for you in the next 16 minutes that I have left with you. How do, are you ready how to live in these last days. What Jesus said at the very last chapter of the entire Bible, in the last few verses, this is how it ends, in Revelations 22 and verse 12, he said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and I am bringing my reward with me to repay everyone according to their works. This is what he's saying. He said, I'm coming, and I'm going to repay you for how you lived your life on this earth. I want to bless you. If you use your life to make a difference in the lives of others, I'm going to bless you. I want to reward you. That's part of one of, that's what's going to happen at the second coming of Jesus. Not the rapture, but after the feast, there's going to be a reward seat. You're going to be rewarded on how you lived your life on this earth. It's much like with my kids. Like people ask me, I get a lot of questions. Well, you guys raising kids, did you give them an allowance to take care of the house? And we don't give our kids allowances, I'm sorry, young people, um, because I don't believe I should pay you to make the bed that you're sleeping in. I don't think I should pay you to take out your trash. But when it comes to vacation season, 
we always like to give them some money so they have money for vacation. And, and, um, and so, and I'll say, hey, here's what I need, pressure wash or go pick up some leaves or something, you know, in the yard or all that. And extra jobs to give them cash so they can have their own money on vacation so they don't have to ask us for money. And, but when it gets closer and closer, I say, hey, don't forget now. Don't forget to do that job because I want to give you that money. And, and what am I doing? What am I trying to do? I'm trying to remind, because I'm their father. I want them blessed. I'm trying, trying to remind them that we're leaving one day. And you're going to get rewarded based upon what did you do. And, he said, and that's what Jesus is doing. He's trying to reward you. In other places in the Bible it says, the bride had made herself ready. And again, this was a whole new concept. Because when Dina and I got married, we didn't have any money. And uh, now when these guys get married, I mean, they have videographers and photographers. And here's a new one, a makeup artist. I saw the bill for a makeup artist. And I said, what are they doing? That's like a plastic surgery. <laughs> but they're charging you. What, what are you? You've been putting your own makeup on your whole life. What do you need this for? <laughs> How much? For one day? Really? That, I'm not lying to you. That could cost more than my first car. <laughs> and we're not even at the ceremony yet. But Dina says, you're doing it. And um, <laughs> why? Because the bride wants to make herself ready. A lot of thought went into that. Because there's a moment where the bride is going to match eyes with the groom. Can I tell you something? That's the picture that this paints right here. There's a moment where Jesus is going to come back. The trumpet is going to sound. He is going to come back, and we're going to be face to face with him. We want to make ourselves ready. So the Bible is amazing. It, God wants you blessed. He wants you ready for that moment. So in the book of Revelations, if you were to read it, there's 22 chapters. The first chapter is an introduction uh, John the Apostle wrote this to the island of Patmos. He had this revelation from God, and you could read through it. But then there's the chapters 2 and 3. In chapters 2 and 3, Jesus appears. There were seven churches. Were really, these were really seven churches that were uh, on the earth then. And he said, the Bible said he walked amongst them. And he said, hey, I'm coming quickly. Let me remind you of some things that I see so you'll be ready for that day. Even though these, these were the seven churches of that time, Honestly, those words have eternal value to us today. And as he spoke to these seven churches, I just thought it would be great. Let me take ten minutes and share with you the things that Jesus shared with them about living in the last days. And he's, he's, there were seven of them. The first one was the church of Ephesus. And this is what he said to them. How much you love me really matters. Not that just you're just putting your faith in me. But if you love me, it really matters. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, he said, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent. Now let me, let me just start off by saying, the first thing Jesus did, I don't have time to do it. He went through all these churches and pointed out all the good things they were doing. He found all the great things they were doing. He goes, hey, by the way, you're doing this. You're doing great. I see you being faithful. I see you standing strong. But I need to remind you. Of something that you need to adjust. He said, you've forsaken your first love. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. And I ask, you know, I don't, someone says, what does that mean? And I don't even know fully myself. But I think it's talking about the power and the presence of God. Something I don't want to happen in my life. And what he's saying is this. Remember when you first fell in love with me. How it was a big deal. And how you get, it, it wasn't routine to you. And I mean, the best part of the service for you was worship. Not the message. The best part of the service was getting close to me. And you were telling everybody about how good God is to you. And what God had done for you. And what he's saying is this. God's not coming back for a church full of people who just want to get to heaven. He's coming back for a relationship with you. He, he loves you. He wants you to reciprocate that back to him. He said, hey, it's just, just really important to me that you love me, that you're on fire for me. Then he said to the next church, it was in Smyrna, and he said, stay faithful. Why do we stay faithful? Because eternity matters. He said, I need you to stay faithful. And he said in chapter 2 and verse 10 to this church, do not be afraid 
of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. And here's the word. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. And I, know, I get it. He said, I need you to be faithful. And there are people in this room today, people that are watching, that you've prayed some prayers that haven't been answered. That, that you, there's some things that haven't gone the way that you wanted them to go in your life. And some things just didn't work out for you like they thought they would work out. And here's what he said, even in the midst of all that, I need you to stay faithful. And, and I just need to remind you that there are Christians all over the world. And I realize that the prayer that you prayed is important. And I realize that what didn't happen in your life, it stings a bit. But I need to put you in con some context here. There are Christians all over the world today, like right this very moment, that are being persecuted for their faith. Do you know, I just read this stat uh, a few months ago. Do you know that, that there are 9,500 churches that were destroyed around the world last year alone? 9,500 that were burned to the ground for that alone. I know it can be tough that things didn't turn out the way you wanted them to turn out. But look at the rest of the world, the martyrs that are out there. There are some three to 5,000 a year that are martyred for their faith. And I just want to take a moment. I think we should just applaud the Christians around the world that are, that are going for it. He said, just stay faithful. I mean, come on. I try to be funny a little bit, but I mean, sometimes we feel like we're being martyred if it's a little too cold or a little too hot in here. You know what I mean? And so, but the rest of the world, I mean, they, they really deal with it. So let's, let's stay faithful. He said to Pergamum, another church, I need you to stay true to God's word. Stay true to my word. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14, he said, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. He said, all these nice things. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Here's what he's saying to them, is there's some of you that are getting some new doctrine. And in this case, this, this Balaam and Nicolaitans, there was two extremes. One was it was extreme grace. It was like, live your life any way you want. It doesn't make a difference. You choose what's best for you. Don't let God choose. The other one was, Nicolaitans were like, man, if you mess up one time, you're not going to heaven. God's turning his back on you. And one was all grace. One was all law. But when Jesus showed up, he said, hey, let's put grace and truth together. That's where the power of the gospel is. And so in other words, here's what we're saying to the modern day church. Jesus is saying, there's going to be a time where people are going to try to redefine the truth. He said, I need you to remember that when I, I meant what I said and I said what I meant, that the Bible is the final authority for our life. Amen? That, that's, just, that's just all he said here. And then he said to the next church, Thyatira, he said, hey, I need you not to compromise. Don't compromise. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20, nevertheless, I have this against you. He said, you tolerate that woman Jezebel, not the same one in, in the Old Testament, a different one. In fact, someone wrote in this week, can you talk about it? Well, here I am, right here. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and at the eating of food sacrificed to idols. And here's with the Thyatira church, what they were struggling with here is this, is that they're trying to change the Bible to fit into their life. Say, well, I was, I was just born that way. And now it's just I'm born that way. God made a mistake. Well, let me just tell you something. I was born mean. I was born angry. I was born impatient. So guess what I did? I got born again. And God put a new nature on the inside of me. He said, hey, there's going to be a generation at the end that's going to try to change the Bible to fit into their culture. He said, do not allow that to happen. He said, I need you to be faithful. In other words, here's what I said. Don't try to change God, change you. This is just where we're living. Don't change God, change you. And then he went on to the church of Sardis. He said, remember that your life has a purpose. 
you're, you, I need to remind you something, that your life's not an accident. And he said it to him like this. He said, wake up. Like, wake up. You're just going through the routine of life and the routine of Christianity and the routine of just existing on this earth. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. This is all he's saying was, whatever you do in this life, make sure you connect some of it to God. Connect some of it to Jesus. He said, hey, have a great career. But just use that career to influence others for the Lord. I mean, acquire stuff. But just be blessed, but make sure you're a blessing. He's like, hey, have a great life, but make sure in, in the greatness you're connecting some of it to eternity. Connect some of it to Jesus. He said to the church of Philadelphia, perseverance matters. He said, you've kept my word. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. You have kept my command to persevere. I don't, I'm out of time, so I'm going to move to the next one. But just that just means stay strong. In the good days and the bad days, just remember our God is faithful. We might not understand everything. We might not understand why it is where it is. But God is good. And then it ends with the last church, the one that you're most familiar with, Laodicea. And here's what I think he's saying. Temperature matters. How hot you are for God makes a difference to Him. How cold you are, how on fire you are, how indifferent you are makes a difference to Him. He said it to him like this in Revelation 3, verse 15. He says, you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. A lot of us read this and go, well, that's just harsh. But really, if you were to go back and study the geography of the time, Laodicea, it was a town that was situated at the bottom of a mountain. And they would have these waters would come off these streams, cold water that would refresh it. But what was unique about Laodicea, and they would understand this, they heard him say this, they also had hot springs, mineral springs that people would go bathe in and soak in and it had a, a lot of it had a lot of minerals in it and it had a lot of health benefits. Like you'd see some of these in Iceland or Glenwood Springs, Colorado and you'd go soak in these hot baths and, and the mud, would whatever's wrong with you, it'd start making you better and so he said, there's you got this cold water that's refreshing and you've got this hot water that's medicinal. He said, both of them have usefulness. He said, but lukewarm water is not useful. And here's what he's saying here. I think the takeaway in this is just simple for me. He said, make sure your life is useful. Don't just be someone who exists. Be someone who's making a difference on this earth in the lives of others. He said, I want a vibrant, alive on fire, full love relationship with you that would make a difference in the lives of others. Now, if you hear this today, I get it. I'm trying to find a way to not make you walk out of here going, wow, I wish I didn't go to church today. And I know you're going to be challenged. But I need you to hear something from your pastor. I just want you to be ready. And I just took the words of Jesus. I didn't add to them or take away from them. I went to those seven churches. And it was going to, I knew it challenged you because it challenged me. I put this together several months ago and I spent Friday re-looking it over and kind of cleaning it up. And I'm not going to lie to you, a couple of things. I, man, in three months I slipped that much. It just challenged me a little bit. And you might feel a little bit condemned today. And, and I don't want you to feel condemnation because condemnation means you're stuck. But challenged means there's room for growth so we can be ready. Just think about that moment. Can twice this year, or in the last six months, rather eight months, there was two weddings in our family, and that significant moment was when the groom locked eyes on the bride. She was glad she made herself ready. He was glad they were coming together. That's that moment. So you might feel today like, I mean, I'm so far gone. I need to let you know the one more thing Jesus said at the last part of that chapters 2 and 3 after he said all of that he said this here am I I stand at the door and I knock he said I just want a relationship with you he said I'm here and I'm knocking if anyone hears my voice 
open the door. I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Here's what I want you to know. He, he so desperately wants to start a vibrant, alive, on fire relationship with him and you today. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for every person here today. Lord, I know, I, I sense, Lord, that even just the presence of God here, Lord, that Jesus is saying, I want more. I want more of a relationship with people today just before I come back. And Lord, I, what I do know is this, that you're not a genie in the bottle, but you're a heavenly Father. And Holy Spirit, in the short time I have left, I'm going to ask you to do something that I couldn't do. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to speak right into the hearts of people. And if we've been challenged today, Lord, through one of these seven churches, through the words of Jesus, others have been inspired to know that we could be a generation that doesn't taste death, but we could be caught up together with the Lord in the air. Lord, we know it's a mystery. The world mocks it, but we see it all through the Bible. And Lord, we want to be ready. So Heavenly Father, I can't answer that question for anyone in this room but for me. Am I ready? And Lord, for the Christian here, if there's adjustments that need to be made, Holy Spirit, help us. If there's someone here that's far from God, they wouldn't even make the rapture because they're not ready. Maybe that you would speak to their heart. That you draw them closer to Jesus right now. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us?